Hey, Mike here. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Dark Poutine early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. You're about to listen to a historical episode of Dark Poutine. After episode 149, you will find Scott is no longer with the show. In an effort to maintain continuity and offer listeners as many episodes as possible, we are leaving the episodes in which he co-hosted intact. Thank you. Welcome to Dark Poutine. I'm Mike Brown, creator and host. With me as usual is my good friend and co-host, Scott Hemingway. Say hello, Scott. I love you all. Oh, that's very nice. Yep, it's Remembrance Day, and and it's good to remember that I love everybody. Well, that's not what we're here to remember. We're here to remember the sacrifices that people made on the battlefield to give us the freedoms that we enjoy today. That's a lot heavier than what I was talking about. You're correct. Wow. Buzzkill. The views, information, and opinions expressed during the Dark Poutine podcast are solely those of the producer and do not necessarily represent those of Curious Cast, its affiliate Global News, nor their parent company, Chorus Entertainment. Dark Poutine is not for the faint of heart or squeamish. Listener discretion is strongly advised. We're not experts on the topics we present, nor are we journalists. We're two ordinary Canadians chatting about crime and the dark side of history. Let's get to it. Put on your toque, grab yourself a double-double and an Nanaimo bar. It's time to scarf down some dark poutine. <coughs> mm, you were hungry. I was very hungry. This is good poutine, too. In our last Remembrance Day episode, we covered the Great War, World War I, and many of its Canadian heroes. In this year's episode, we want to remind Canadians about one of the darkest moments of the Second World War for our country. Over two days just after D-Day on June 7th and 8th, 1944, 18 Canadian POWs were murdered by members of the fanatical Nazis in the 12th SS Panzer Division Hitlerjugend in a garden at Abbey d'Ardenne, or Ardenne Abbey, at saint germain la blanche herbe near Caen in France. This sounds terrible already. This is episode 99, Remembrance Day, the Ardenne Abbey Massacre. Much of the research from this episode comes from articles published on the Veterans Affairs Canada website, as well as Kurt Meyer on Trial, a documentary record edited by P. Whitney Leisenbauer and Chris M. V. Madsen for Canadian Defence Academy Press. These two sources contain detailed information about these particular war crimes and have been made accessible for everyone who wishes to learn more. We'll post links to these and a few other sources in our show notes. Just a little less than two years prior to D-Day, Canadian forces saw another of their darkest moments during the raid on Dieppe. Mm, Yes, I've heard of that one. The Allies needed to penetrate Hitler's well-fortified Atlantic Wall to gain a foothold in mainland Europe. From Veterans Affairs Canada, quote, At this point, the Allied forces weren't strong enough to mount Operation Overlord, the full-scale invasion of Western Europe. Instead, the Allies decided to mount a major raid on the French port of Dieppe. It was designed to test new equipment and gain the experience and knowledge necessary for planning a great amphibious assault that would one day be necessary to defeat Germany. Also, after years of training in Britain, some Canadian politicians and generals were anxious for Canadian troops to experience battle. Canadian soldiers were the main force to be used as guinea pigs for the raid called Operation Jubilee. Mm. Their objectives were to take and hold a French port for some time to boost morale in Allied forces and show the Germans it could be done. 
They were to inflict as much havoc as they could in the area and retreat after making a mess of everything strategically important to the Germans. None of these things happened. Mm, shit. In the early morning of August 19, 1942, the assault came at five points across 16 kilometers of a French beach near the northern coastal town of Dieppe. According to Veterans Affairs Canada, Canadians made up the great majority of the attackers in the raid. Nearly 5,000 of the 6,100 troops were Canadians. The remaining troops consisted of approximately 1,000 British commandos and 50 American rangers. The raid was supported by eight Allied destroyers and 74 air squadrons, eight belonging to the Royal Canadian Air Force. I had no idea so many of the troops were Canadian. It was very strongly Canadian. Yeah, yeah. The, the bulk. Over eight hours, the order to retreat was given after six. Almost everything that could go wrong did. Yeesh. At sea, 33 landing craft and a destroyer were lost. In the air, things didn't go much better. A whopping 106 RAF aircraft were destroyed, almost a third of those to heavy anti-aircraft fire. Another 13 Canadian RAF planes were also lost. It's so surreal. I mean, when just going through this, they're, they're numbers. They're numbers. But, then, but the, there's but then a you, human being attached to every single one of those. Multiple when you're talking planes. And so to, to each one of these individuals, like... Oh, the the horror they had to endure and, and see and oh, mm -hmm. yeah, it's crazy. The forces on land were pounded, and many were killed or paralyzed in place by withering mortar, artillery, and heavy machine gun fire coming from the reinforced concrete pillboxes and bunkers. The tanks that made it past all the barriers didn't fare well either, according to Veterans Affairs Canada. They quote found their way blocked by concrete obstacles that sealed off the narrow streets. Still, the immobilized tanks continued to fight supporting the infantry and contributing greatly to the withdrawal of many of the soldiers. The tank crews themselves became prisoners of war or died in battle. <sighs> the losses for the operation on the side of the Allies were heavy. Of the 4,963 Canadians who embarked for the operation, only 2,210 returned to England, mm. and many of these were wounded. There were 3,367 casualties, including 1,946 prisoners of war. 916 Canadians lost their lives. Holy shit, wow. And going to that previous paragraph, it's stuck in my head. The immobilized tanks, they were stuck in a mobile... Like, you're just... Yeah, you're the, sitting duck in a tin can. The fear in that moment, because, yeah, you're just... You've seen Fury, right? The yeah, oh yeah, it's great. Yeah. I mean, you're just you're going to be just sitting there knowing what's coming. Mm -hmm. Limited resources to fight. Oh. Yep, you only have so much ammunition. Yeah. Adding insult to injury, the Germans reported on the incident first, calling the invasion a joke that only proved the superiority of the German forces. Mm. As with many battles, there were heroes, too. Among those who received medals for acts of valor that day were two who received the Victoria Cross, the Commonwealth's highest military decoration for bravery. One Victoria Cross recipient was Lieutenant Colonel Charles Cecil Ingersoll Merritt. What a name. No. That's a very, that's a very dignified, uh, dignified name. name is right. Well, there's like seven names in there. <laughs> yeah. He was wounded twice already and led multiple groups of soldiers across a bridge during the main attack. Despite his wounds, as he'd see one group across, he'd return for another, endangering his own life many times in service of the mission. When the retreat was finally called, he and his men held off the Germans as other soldiers made it safely back to the beach under heavy fire. Merritt himself was not able to escape, and he and his men became POWs. The word hero gets bantied about often, but the, these troops, yeah, anybody serving in, in, in combat in, in the military, they're real heroes. The second Victoria Cross recipient that day was Reverend John Weir Foote, and he was the chaplain of the Royal Hamilton Light Infantry. According to Veterans Affairs Canada, he, quote, calmly 
through eight hours of grueling battle, continually exposed himself to every intense fire to help move the injured to an aid post, saving many lives through his brave efforts. Then, at the end of his ordeal, he jumped from the landing craft that would have taken him to safety. He walked courageously into the German positions to be taken prisoner so he could minister to his fellow Canadians who were now POWs. Wow. Right? There's a guy who's committed. <sighs> Dedication, commitment, yep. strength. All of, those, all of the above. Wow. This is important to mention as the lessons learned at Dieppe helped to ensure the D-Day raid on June 6, 1944 would be a success. The cost to many Canadian families was immeasurable. Fathers, sons, and brothers did not come home from Dieppe. Many lay buried in French cemeteries. A plaque on the memorial in Square du Canada, in the center of Dieppe, translated from French reads, quote, On the 19th of August, 1942, on the beaches of Dieppe, our Canadian cousins marked with their blood the road to our final liberation for telling us their victorious return on September 1st, 1944. Mm. So the mm -hmm. Canadians liberated Dieppe in 1944. Yeah. Crazy. <sighs> There's so many visuals in my head when you're thinking of war. Well, you can't... You, I mean, like... I mean, we've seen pictures. You've seen pictures. We've seen footage. Yeah. Uh, but actually having been there and hearing it and smelling it and feeling the concussions. One of my favorite photographers was a conflict photographer. They're making a movie about him. It's going to, uh, uh, Tom Hardy star as him, but, uh, he, he, like his photos, I saw his photos to me really paint a picture of war, like just some the the faces mm -hmm. on the people he's capturing in yeah. his photos and, and yeah it's the, not a posed thing this is a real moment no yeah, yeah. Don McCullen if yep. you, you check him out if you if you're listening he's yeah like, he is fantastic his, his photos are just my birth mother's father Royce Ring was a member of the Black Watch the mm. Royal Highland Regiment of Canada. That regiment was involved in Operation Jubilee and were at Dieppe that day. Four of the regiment died there while others were injured. We know Royce was present for the liberation of Holland after the regiment landed in France in July of 1944. Mm. This is where he met Marianne Wolfe, who became my maternal grandmother. We're not sure if Royce was at Dieppe or not, but he's not around to confirm. I mm -hmm. think he joined later on in the oh, war. Okay, okay. Oh. Did you have any family who attended the Second World War? Were they, was anybody? I, I always struggle with, my, I believe my grandfather on my dad's side was World War I because my dad is in his 80s. Yeah, my dad also, uh, his father was World War I. Yeah, so I, I, I have a large family, so it's quite possible that sure. somebody fought in there, but uh, not that I'm aware of. I don't know of anybody who fought in World War II, but... Uh, it's crazy to think. I always think about like when you're talking history, um, all it would have taken was one. Like I'm just thinking, like it should, had my grandfather gone to, and maybe he did. I don't know. But it, hypothetically, if he had gone there and w didn't survive, like there, there's this generations of my family that would not exist. Yep. Mm -hmm. I would not be here. Like, well, our family has that from the Holocaust. There's, oh, there's certain. Fuck. Branches of the family that don't exist because of that. Oh, God. Oh. On to D-Day. Canada's contributions, June 6, 1944, were significant. From the Canadian War Museum, of the nearly 150,000 Allied troops who landed or parachuted into the invasion area, 14,000 of them were Canadians. They assaulted a beachfront codenamed Juno, while Canadian paratroopers landed just east of the assault beaches although the Allies encountered German defenses bristling with artillery, machine guns, mines, and booby traps, the invasion was a success. And before I go on with this quote, the population of Canada was only around 10,000 or 10 million at the time. Oh, wow. Okay. And Canada's contribution to the entire World War II was around 970,000 men. Holy shit. So almost a tenth of the country yeah. went to war. Holy shit. It's pretty amazing. Wow. Other Canadians helped achieve this victory. The Royal Canadian Navy, 
contributed 110 ships and 10,000 sailors in support of the landings, while the RCAF had helped prepare the invasion by bombing targets inland. On D-Day and during the ensuing campaign, 15 RCAF fighter and fighter-bomber squadrons helped control the skies over Normandy and attack enemy targets. On D-Day, Canadians suffered 1,074 casualties, including 359 killed. So that's quite high numbers mm -hmm. again. Mm -hmm. There were five codenamed beaches across 40 kilometers in Normandy invaded by the Allies during Operation Overlord. From east to west, the U.S. had Utah Beach near St. Mariglis and Omaha Beach near Trivier. The Brits had Gold Beach near Arromanches and Canada was assigned Juno Beach near corzul sur mer and 20 or so kilometers north of Caen, a major objective. The Brits also had Sword Beach further to the east. The best way to have any understanding of what the day was like is to hear from someone who was there. Oh, wow. In June of 2019, Global News published a video of a Souk, BC-born, 95-year-old veteran of the Shearbrook Fusiliers, Hugh Buckley, a tank gunner on D-Day. Their tank made it further into France than any had been expected on that day. Let's listen to a bit of Global's audio of Hugh recounting mm. that day. My name is Hugh Buckley. My rank on D-Day was trooper in the Armored Corps, Sherbrooke Fusiliers. There were ships to the horizon, you know, and you thought nothing could stop this. It was most reassuring. It gave you great confidence. They really couldn't have stopped this. And they didn't, of course. We were all, I think, seasick. It was, we were in a tank landing craft. When you're very seasick, and I've been seasick before, you, you say, I'm, I could just as easily die right now. <laughs> so it can't be much worse than this. We were very happy to see the land. Before we left, they showed us pictures of what the beach would look like. There's a, a prominent house on the beach, and you're to leave that house on the right-hand side. Most of the fighting had gone off on the beaches. There was still quite a lot of damage and misery. The whole object of the that area was to take Caen, which was the transportation center for the German army. Um, and where the arrow hit. And I think uh, morale was very high, and we were all volunteers. And we were the reconnaissance troop. There were 11 tanks in our troop that day. We were, had these Stuart tanks. Good thing about them is they're very fast. It's very hard to hit, hit a tank moving. And that was our defense. And there was more resistance to the tanks so the, than we uh, knew about. My job was to fire the gun and operate the radio. We, as a tank regiment, came face to face with the 12th Nazi Panzer Division, which was probably the, one of the very top operating tank regiments. We had 11 tanks in our troop, and there were three operating the next day. Why did I survive? Uh, God was good. <laughs> you just lived from day to day, I think. Uh, that's, that's really what we did. Wow. That is just in intense to hear. Yeah. What I heard listening to that was I heard a person who really remembers this for what it was. Mm -hmm. And he has done a lot of reflection on those events over the years. And 
has come to terms with it. He comes off very much as a storyteller, but mm-hmm. that that doesn't sound right because it sounds he's not like, a braggart at all, and it, and it's not coming off as like um, impassioned, dispassionate. Like, like it, it's just you, you're hearing him talk, and uh, there there seemed to, to be a sense of gratitude. Mm-hmm. You can really hear him uh, talking about his survival. A humble guy. Yeah, like it's just. You, you you imagine the existence, the the life, the lives of each one of those people fighting, and, and and every day you wake up fully expecting to die. Yeah, having imagine that waking up every day you're expecting this could be the in last all likelihood day. Yep. I'm going to die. Like oh, Mister Buckley referenced their troop coming up against the twelfth SS Panzer Division. Many of the members of this force had been brought up in the Hitler youth and were rabidly Nazi. Mm. And this is why they were also nicknamed the Hitler Jugend, which was Hitler Youth. The leader of this German tank brigade was 34 year old SS Brigade Fuhrer Kurt Panzer Meyer. Mm. He was a fervent Nazi, born in Jerksheim, Germany. Jerks. <laughs> I'm glad you said it. Yeah. I mean, yeah. To a lower class family. As with many World War II families, Kurt's father, a miner, had also fought in World War I. His father was embarrassed by Germany's surrender to Allied forces in 1918. Mm. He brought this resentment home and passed it and his anger on to his eight year old son, Kurt. Passing the torch of anger. Yep. That's how racism happens. Yeah. Thanks to his father's rhetoric, Kurt was active in the Hitler Youth from the time he was 15, and at 20, now working as a policeman in mecklenburg schwerin he became a full-fledged member of the Nazi party and espoused the party's ideals of racial purity, loathing of the Untermensch, which literally translated as underman. Mm. This word is used to describe non-Aryan races, the subhumans. These included Jews, the Romani people, the Slavic races, Russians, and blacks, as well as those differently abled, mentally and or physically. Mm-hmm. All required extermination, according to the Nazis, which took various forms, but many were starved and worked to death as slave labor during the reign of the Third Reich. Oh, and we all have those images in our heads. Yeah. Kurt Meyer flew up the ranks and was rubbing elbows with Nazi party insiders, even Hitler himself as he was a guest at the marriage of Nazi Party's notorious propaganda minister, Joseph Goebbels, in 1931. Mm. This was the same year that Kurt Meyer became a member of the SS, or Schutzstaffel, which translated literally as Protection Squadron. From its inception in 1925 until the end of the Reich in 1945, the SS became, quote, the foremost agency of security, surveillance, and terror within Germany and German-occupied Europe. And that they did. Yeah. Terror is a good word. Yeah. When speaking about the SS, they were entrusted with the creation of the concentration and death camps as part of Hitler's final solution. Just the sight of a member of the SS in an occupied European village or town sent shivers down spines. Oh, I bet. Even in Germany itself, they were revered by some and feared by many. Yeah. Even before the war, the paramilitary group had shown people what kind of violence they were capable of. Kristallnacht and other interesting things that they did to the Jewish people. Mm. In 1934, Meyer joined the 1st Panzer Division, which would later be rolled into the Waffen-SS, the combat branch of the Schutzstaffel. Meyer was there when Austria was annexed and when Czechoslovakia was occupied a, a year later. He spent time in Russia during Operation Barbosa and was awarded a high honor the Knight's Cross with oak leaves for having his men burn down a Russian village whose citizens dared to fight back, albeit feebly, against his troops. Meyer was so irritated by the gall of the locals, he personally shot the 25-year-old woman who was making lunch for he and his men. What the... He was a gentleman and a scholar, it Oh, clearly, like. clearly. This is just the beginning. Oh, I look forward to the rest. This brings us to the summer of 1943, when Meyer was entrusted with the 25th SS Panzer Grenadier Regiment of the brand spanking new 12th SS Panzer Division, which first saw action on June 7th, 1944, the day after D-Day. 
Meyer and the rest of the division got their orders only hours after the D-Day invasion had begun. Get to Khan and drive the invaders back into the Atlantic. From HistoryNet.com, quote, at 5 o'clock on the afternoon of June 6, 1944, the division's 229 tanks and assault guns, 658 armored vehicles, and some 2,000 soft-skinned vehicles and 20,540 men moved off along three routes. Mm, shit. At 10 a.m. on June 7, Meyer and his 25th SS Panzer Grenadier Regiment moved into Caen to face the invading Allied forces. Many of the soldiers, commanded by Meyer, were children. From HistoryNet.com Quote, in the 1st Battalion, for example, 65% were under 18 years old. Only 3% were over 25, and almost all of these soldiers were officers and non-coms. Seeing a fully kitted out 16-year-old SS soldier was not unusual. That's just insane. They're kids. Kid children. That's a kid. Uh, they did terrible things, but there's such a part of me, too, that is like, these poor 16-year-old kids weren't given the chance to live. They yep. were brainwashed yep. early yep. Exactly. on, fed exactly. this shit, yep. Yep. made to do these terrible things, instead of just getting to be 16-year-olds. Exactly. So the German soldiers were met, actually, by 10 divisions of Allied soldiers who'd poured into the country over the past 24 hours like a tsunami, killing every German soldier who wanted to fight. Mm -hmm. Meyer's command group took up residence in the Ardennes Abbey, a massive collection of medieval buildings, including an early Gothic church and several farm buildings encircled by walls and surrounded by grain fields. There, Meyer utilized the tall church tower to oversee and command the battle that was raging below between the advancing Canadians and his ground forces, complemented by at least 50 Mark IV Panzer tanks. Mm. Meyer laughed, calling the Canadians little fish, continuing, we'll throw them back into the sea in the morning. You're a dick. The Germans built their communication center in the cellar, under the flour mill, and also installed a first aid station there. Small armored vehicles were kept in the barn on the property. This is where, for a month, the 12th German Division would resist the onslaught of the Canadian forces in a futile effort to hold on to the city of Caen. From Patrick Brode's book, Casual Slaughters and Accidental Judgments, Canadian War Crimes and Prosecutions from 1944 to 48, quote, Meyer determined to strike his 3rd Battalion, supported by tanks from the 12th Panzer SS Regiment, would attack the exposed Canadian flanks. It was these grenadiers who smashed into the North Novas and Sherbrooke Fusiliers on the afternoon of June 7th and drove them back from Authie and Bouron. However, an artillery barrage halted the counterattack, end quote. Also from Broad's book, quote, The historian of the North Novas describes what happened next. Quote, there was never a wilder melee than at Authy. Amid the smoke and dust and shooting, Captain Fraser kept shooting until he was killed. So did the North Novas with him, and the Sherbrooke Fusiliers and Cameron Highlanders who elected to fight to the finish. They took a dreadful toll of the fanatical SS troops, end quote. Holy shit, what brave men. And we'll take a bit of a break right here. Yes, please. And we're back. Both sides were beaten and battered, and many POWs were taken on either side as well, both during and after the fighting that day. The SS brought the Canadian POWs back to the Abbey for safekeeping until they could be moved to a POW camp later on. After the battle on June 7, 1944, on the orders of Kurt Meyer, 11 POWs were randomly selected from the group of between 75 and 100 Canadian soldiers, and they were taken away. They did not return. Mm. The rest of the POWs were taken to Bretville sur odon to a POW camp. From Veterans Affairs Canada, that evening, the 11 POWs were taken to the Chateau's garden and killed. <sighs> of the 11 murdered, unarmed soldiers were five from the North Nova Scotia Highlanders. According to Veterans Affairs Canada, they were Private Ivan Lee Crow born on November 17, 1921, 
and son of Arthur D. and Clara M. Crow of Stewiak, Colchester, Nova Scotia. Private Charles Doucette, born July 15, 1912 in Sydney, Nova Scotia, and son of Peter and Mary Doucette of Sydney, Nova Scotia, husband of Mary Jane Doucette of Sydney, Nova Scotia. Corporal Joseph Francis McIntyre, 28 years old, son of Daniel and Florence McIntyre of Sydney Mines, Nova Scotia. Private Reginald Keeping, born on September 19, 1922 in Bergio, Newfoundland and Labrador, son of Wilson and Maud Keeping of New Waterford, Nova Scotia. Private James Alvin Moss, born June 26, 1921 in Stellarton, Nova Scotia and son of Samuel and Elaine Moss of Stellarton, Nova Scotia. Six of the 11 were Shearbrook Fusiliers, a.k.a. the 27th Canadian Armored Regiment. They were Trooper Elgin Bolt, born on October 24, 1919 in St. Thomas, Ontario, and son of William John Bolt and Matilda Francis Bolt of Collingwood, Ontario. Trooper George Vincent Gill, born on May 20, 1921 in Middlesbrough, York Yorkshire, United Kingdom, and son of Leopold Louis and Susan Martha Gill of Brockville, Ontario. Trooper Thomas Halliburton Henry, born on March 12, 1922, and son of Thomas Halliburton Henry and May Alita Millet Henry of Georgetown, British Guyana. Trooper Roger Lockhead, born on January 30, 1919, in Ville, St. Pierre, Montreal, Quebec, and son of Norman and Ida Lockhead of Rollette, Quebec, husband of Rose Lockhead of Rock Forest, Quebec. Trooper Harold George Philp, born on October 21, 1911, in Manila, Ontario, son of William N. and Hannah Philp of Manila, Ontario. And finally, one of their leaders, Lieutenant Thomas Alfred Lee Windsor, born on November 10, 1914, in Montreal, Quebec, son of Cora Wheeler and Alfred Windsor of Montreal. His siblings were Walter Charles Douglas and Margaret, Tom fell in love and married Roma Helen Jackson, also of Montreal, Quebec. And I read those names and their families because I want people to remember that these weren't just 11, peop 11 soldiers that died. They were 11 people who had families that loved them. Families that loved them, families that they loved. Uh, people who, there are probably people alive today who wish they had known them. Yep. Yep, and and you add to that list friends, you know, like it's, yeah, you know, these were people, yeah, not just numbers, each one of them. The next day, the Nazis weren't done. Seven more POWs, all North Nova Scotia Highlanders, would be brought to the Abbey. They were quote interrogated and sent one by one to their deaths. In ten minutes, it was over. They shook hands with their comrades before being escorted to the garden, where they were each shot in the back of the head with machine pistols. Private Jan Jesenik, a young Polish soldier who had been pressed into service in the Hitler Youth Division, was witness to the interrogation and shooting, and reported them after the war. End quote. Holy shit. Imagine that. Shaking your buddy's hand, saying, Okay, this is it? Yeah. Knowing you're going to be killed. Mm -hmm. How do you, like, how does the brain function in that moment? You I have to. I'm, like, I don't understand. Like, oh, yeah. Oh, to have to live. We're, I'm grateful that you and I don't know what that feels oh, like. It, uh, God, I just want to hug everybody. There, the seven murdered soldiers were, according to Veterans Affairs Canada, Private Walter Michael Doherty, born on August 26, in 1916 at Galway, son of Francis Xavier and Ella Mary Doherty at Beaverbrook, Newfoundland. Private Hollis Leslie McKeel, born on December 1st, 1910 in Lower Selma, Nova Scotia, and son of Daniel and Ada McKeel of Lower Selma, Nova Scotia, husband of Violet Audrey Jean McKeel of Truro, Colchester, Nova Scotia. Private Hugh Allen McDonald, 24 years old from New Glasgow, Nova Scotia, and son of Duncan A. and Elizabeth MacDonald of New Glasgow, Nova Scotia. Private George Richard McNaughton, 20, 21 years old, birthplace and family not listed. 
Private George Edward Miller, 19 years old of Renfrew, Ontario, and son of George Wellington Miller and Inez Miller of Renfrew, Ontario. Private Thomas Edward Mont, 25 years old of Amherst, Nova Scotia, and son of Harry and, Ellen, and Helen Mont, husband of Joan Louise Mont of Amherst, Nova Scotia. And finally, Private Raymond Moore of Kentville, Nova Scotia, and son of Charlie and Bertha Moore, both of Kentville. It's believed on the 17th of June, 1944, another pair of Canadian soldiers, Lieutenant Fred Williams and Lance Corporal George Pollard, both from Stormont, Dundas, and Glengarry Highlanders, were also executed at the Abbey by Myers' men. According to Veterans Affairs Canada story on the pair, quote, they had been patrolling for disabled German tanks near Bouron when they went missing. It is known that two wounded Canadian POWs were evacuated by Germans to the Abbey's first aid post on June 17th. Witnesses later reported hearing shots in the vicinity of the Abbey at two different times that day. Do we find out uh, the why they were executed? We'll get into that. Okay. I knew you were going to ask that soon. Yeah. The Regina Rifles liberated Arden Abbey on July 8th, 1944. 200 Canadians died that day, taking the badly battered yeah. Abbey. It's unknown what the losses were on the German side, but they must have been massive. Yeah. Myers and his men scampered away like rats. Lieutenant Fred Williams' body was discovered by liberating force, and Pollard is still listed as missing. His body has never been found. Oh, man. The Germans had left in a hurry. In Kurt Myers' bedroom beside a tidily made-up bed was a basket of cherries. A few of the soldiers stole and drank his champagne and ate his cherries. One of the exhausted officers went to sleep in Meyer's bed. It's like, yeah, in your face, buddy. Yeah, we'll, no, we'll, we'll, right? we'll eat your cherries and drink your booze and yeah. sleep in your bed. Well, you run away like a coward and a rat. Well, this coward and rat was promoted <laughs> to SS Standartenfuhrer and later SS Oberfuhrer, the highest rank attainable by one beneath the rank of general. Mm. He went on to command the entire division in the weeks after D-Day, after the death of his predecessor. He also received another award, Knight's Cross with Oak Leaves and Swords for Military Valor Outstanding Leadership in August of 1944 for his service in the weeks after D-Day. Getting accommodation, a medal. Uh, for being a murderer. For uh, outstanding leadership. So... <laughs> A great job uh, leading these 16-year-olds to their death. And then murdering Canadian soldiers. And then murdering Canadian soldiers. Ordering like, your men to murder them. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, good good yeah. distinction yeah, there. Like, exactly, because it, it means he didn't do it, right? I mean, if nothing smells promotion, like 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 what does? that? That's yeah. what... Uh, it's widely believed that Meyer's 12th SS Panzer Division, Hitler Jugend, butchered numerous Allied prisoners. As many as 156 Canadian prisoners of war are believed to have been executed by the 12th SS Panzer Division. Just, mm. I'll say that again. 156. Prisoners of war. Prisoners of war. And this is in the month after D-Day. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, Mike. I wanted to, you, you're not supposed to kill prisoners of war. We get into that. <laughs> the killers often pointed to the bombings of German civilians as their justification for their atrocities, seeming to forget the damage that German forces had inflicted across Europe and continue to do on England almost daily. You can't hold a high ground of elitism in war because no matter what side you're on, Pe 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 you're killing people. Yeah. So you, you can't stand on this moral high ground. This is justified because they did bad. Well, you're all doing bad things. You either have those boundaries or you don't. But there are rules of engagement. Yeah. Which, you know, not everybody's bound by, but Germany was one of those countries that had signed off on the Geneva Convention. Yeah. And we will get into what that means. Mm -hmm. Months after the murders, in January 1945, 15-year-old Michelle Vico a resident whose family owned the grounds of the abbey had returned after the Germans left. Oh. He was digging in the grass of the small park on the abbey grounds. Eesh. He found a human jawbone after only a few inches. Yes. He ran home to tell his mother, Francine, and his older, older brother, Jean-Marie. 
They dug a little more and discovered more bones. The trio quickly covered up the find, and Michelle put a makeshift cross on top of the remains. The Vicos called authorities, and six bodies were moved from shallow graves in the park and taken for forensic testing. The speculation right away was that these were some of the Canadian soldiers. Yeah. Until now, presumed missing after being captured. Yet their uniforms confirmed it, but IDing some would be arduous. Even though some ID discs were present, they wanted to be sure who was who. Mm -hmm. Some of the dead had been clearly shot in the backs of their heads by small caliber weapons. Others appeared to have had their heads crushed with heavy blows from a blunt instrument. The number two Canadian Graves Concentration Unit one of the groups responsible for the recovering of bodies of Canadians who died during the war had the grim task of unearthing the first set of bodies. I didn't even know that that kind of job existed. I, I guess because I'm not a military person, but it makes sense to cover soldiers who were buried on the battlefield. I had a friend uh, who I met through the MMA community. Mm -hmm. he, uh, his job is currently... He still, uh, he travels to different countries in search of bodies from PO, of POWs from Vietnam. To bring home. From, yeah. yeah. Uh, like that, like it, it's still going on. Yeah. Searching for these. So yeah, his job is to go and, and find and retrieve them. Captain P.S. Bell of the Graves Concentration Unit was asked what he'd found. He said, I found the bodies of six Canadian soldiers. Hmm. After being asked what type of grave the bodies were in and what positions they were in, he stated, quote, There in a grave approximately two feet deep and four feet square, they were in two layers, three soldiers buried side by side with their heads facing toward the main buildings of the abbey, and underneath them were three soldiers with the heads in the opposite direction. End quote. Captain Bell had encountered many graves dug hastily in battle to preserve the remains of fallen so brothers, uh, fallen brother f Canadian soldiers, but he had never seen anything like this. They were all in battle dress, not wrapped in blankets as was customary. Three had boots, had no boots, while the others did, mm. and they had no weapons near them. Mm. These were clearly not killings in the heat of battle. These were cold-blooded murder against the tenets of the Geneva Convention. Yeah. From History.com, quote, The Geneva Convention was a series of international diplomatic meetings that produced a number of agreements, in particular the Humanitarian Law of Armed Conflicts, a group of international laws for the humane treatment of wounded or captured military personnel, medical personnel, and non-military civilians during war. These killings appeared to fit the criteria of war crimes. Yeah. In March 1945, another Vico son who'd been serving the French military came home on leave. He went for a walk around the grounds of the abbey and found the ground in an alleyway to be sunken. Mm. An experienced soldier, he thought he knew what he was looking at, shallow graves. Yeah. He dug a bit out of curiosity and found a body just under a few inches of topsoil. Again, the authorities were called. Into May, bodies were carefully uncovered on the grounds of the abbey. One grave in particular contained 11 bodies, all wearing the uniforms of Canadian soldiers. Mm. The Vico children also turned in a pair of heavy wooden clubs that they'd found on the grounds of the abbey. The clubs were stained with blood and later compared to the wounds caused by the crushing blows at another number of the skulls of the deceased soldiers, and oh. they matched. Oh, what a disgusting way to go. Trying to determine who was responsible might not have been difficult. It was well known that it was Meyer and his men who'd been at the Abbey at the time of the mm -hmm. executions. Meyer had been a POW in American hands since he'd surrendered in Belgium after his headquarters were raided by an American armored column in September of 1944. So just months later. Yeah. I like, the, I like the sound of him being uh, captured. He successfully hid his identity as an SS member or officer until November. Mm. He was then taken to England, jailed there, and interrogated. Once the war in Europe was over, gathering evidence of war crimes cases became easier in some ways but tougher in others. Some of the people were dead and had no tales to tell. Mm -hmm. Others 
who the Nazis had pressed unwillingly into service, began to roll over on them and tell some hair-raising tales of what they'd seen. Many of the Nazis, including Kurt Meyer, although still spewing Nazi rhetoric, denied even knowing anything at all, as he knew that his neck could be stretched for a hint of involvement in war crimes. Yeah. Meyer, thanks to the testimony of people on both sides who'd been at the Abbey with he and his men, was suspect number one in ordering the murders of at least 18 and possibly those two more Canadian soldiers who were unlucky enough to be captured by his group. And more was revealed after that. Mm. From the special interrogation report on Kurt Meyer by G Intelligence Headquarters Canadian Forces in the Netherlands, 24th October 1945, Quote, standing approximately 5 feet 10 inches, in height, broad shoulder, thick set, his whole appearance dominated by his cold gray-blue eyes, which fixed one with what almost amounts to a stare whenever he is talking. Kurt Meyer is the personification of National Socialism. His mind, paralyzed with long propaganda, is quite unable to even consider any other point of view. No, oh, I should what a terrifying, like, I'm, I can, I'm trying to imagine standing in front of that. Still every inch an arrogant Nazi. Yeah, 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 but unwilling to just own up to what he's done. Oh, yeah. yeah, so. He doesn't I, have to. He doesn't have to tell you that. You're nobody. Uh, well, correct. <laughs> <laughs> the Canadian War Crimes Commission, led by Lieutenant Colonel Bruce MacDonald, worked hard at investigating Meyer and his group for more than a year. After all was said and done, Meyer was charged. According to trial documents, in summary, the five charges were First charge, committing a war crime prior to June 7, 1944, Meyer had incited troops under his command to deny quarter to surrendering allies. Mm -hmm. So saying not to give them any quarter is to just kill them regardless. Yeah. Second charge, committing a war crime on or around 7th of June, 1944, Meyer was responsible for his troops killing 23 Canadian prisoners of war at Buron and Othi. This was before what happened at okay. the Abbey. Okay. So he, he, he does this. This is his thing. Yeah. Third charge, committing a war crime on or around the 8th of June, Meyer ordered his troops to kill seven Canadian prisoners of war at his headquarters in the Abbey Ardain. Fourth charge, alternative to the third charge, committing a war crime, on or around the 8th of June, Meyer was responsible for his troops killing seven prisoners, Canadian prisoners of war as above. Mm -hmm. So he's charged with ordering and then when they carry it out. Fifth charge, mm -hmm. committing a war crime. On or around the 8th of June, Meyer was responsible for his troops killing 11 Canadian prisoners of war as above. Okay. As was expected, Meyer pled not guilty. He stood trial in December of 1945 in the German town of Aurich. There was a 700-page document on this. Yeah. Oh, wow. And so I read a lot of it in my research. And so I've tried to pare this 700 pages down. It was a bit of a gong show, this trial, because, you know, he was deny, deny, deny. Yeah. And some of the witnesses were confused and... Then they would recant on their testimony because they are looking at him and they're afraid of him. Yeah, yeah. Well, I it's frustrating because he clearly is proud of what he's done. Oh, yeah. When you hear about this man, he's clearly proud of what... If you're proud of what you've done, then own up to it, you piece of shit. Yeah. Like, just like... It, well, it gets worse, Scott. Oh, lovely. From warhistoryonline.com, quote... One of the main witnesses to the case was SS Private Alfred Helsel, who confirmed to the Canadian authorities that he and other soldiers under Meyer's command were given orders not to take prisoners. However, Helsel withdrew his claim in court, but was later convinced to confirm it again. Mm -mm. Citizens of the town of Othi and Boron testified against the 12th SS to the various atrocities committed against Canadian soldiers, end quote. Mm. Sergeant Stanley Dudka of the North Nova Scotia Highlanders gave some dramatic testimony at the trial. He was one of the men who had been captured and taken to the uh, Abbey as a POW. Mm. He'd seen a lot that day. I can only imagine. Immediately after they were taken prisoner, the men were being marched to the holding area at the Abbey. 
Dudka was trying to help a wounded Canadian named Hargreaves walk as he was really struggling. Mm -hmm. Hargreaves was pulled out of the procession and Dudka was ordered at gunpoint to march on, eyes front. He heard two distinct shots behind him about 30 yards away. Hargreaves was never seen again. As they marched, Dudka saw more bodies of Canadian soldiers, some that he knew, along the roadside. He counted 15 dead men at one place. None were armed. It appeared all had been executed by the roadside. Oh, my God. This is where those 23 charges yeah, came from. Yeah, Dudka then explained what had happened once they arrived at the Abbey's grounds. While I was at the Abbey, the Germans asked for volunteers. Ten men, I believe, he said. Nobody volunteered. The men had no idea what they were volunteering for, so the Germans just picked them, taking them away. The testimony of the Polish man, Jan Jesenek, who had been pressed into service in the SS, mm -hmm. was key to the case. Mm -hmm. He'd seen the interrogations in the garden of six Canadian soldiers. He testified, quote, I saw how the SS officer talked to some of them, and I saw how one Canadian there came to tears, whereupon the officer laughed sneeringly. Oh, fuck. Other Germans stood by laughing also. Jesenik watched as one by one Canadians were marched past him into the courtyard, out of sight, and shot. He later saw their bodies. All had been shot in the head. That's about as, as uh, good a witness as you're going to get. Gonna get. From warhistoryonline.com, quote, Meyer defended himself, claiming he had no knowledge of the ex executions. He said that he had seen the bodies in the garden two days after they were shot, but by his own testimony, he was disgusted and ordered the bodies to be buried. He also claimed that he even tried to punish the ones who had killed the Canadians, but was unsuccessful in conducting the punishment. These claims were refuted by French teenagers, however, who lived in the Abbey and testified that no bodies were visible in the garden when they went the day after the murders, mm. end quote. Sounds like old Kurt couldn't keep his story straight. Nope, 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 nope. Meyer was found guilty of the war crimes laid out in the charges and sentenced to hang. However, Meyer's death sentence was never carried out as it was commuted to life in prison. Mm. He did his time in Dorchester Penitentiary until he was freed on September 7, 1954, after serving only nine years. Sorry, I think I didn't, I must have misheard you. Did you, did you say fried? Not fried, he was freed. Freed. So he... He did his time in Dorchester Penitentiary until he was freed on... Freed. November. Freed. 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 Yeah. Holy schnitzel. He moved back to Germany where he became involved with a group of Waffen SS men, former, who claimed the SS had not committed a single war crime. Oh, how, wow, how convenient. In his biography, which I read bits of and got very angry doing so. I can only imagine. He called the evidence against him at his trial nonsense. He died of a heart attack on December 23rd, 1961 at 51 years old. But wait, <sighs> 15,000 people attended his funeral. To piss on his grave? No, to celebrate a war hero. Mike! And that's the end of this story. Mike! So now I have to go home full of rage? I told you you were going to be angry at the end of this one. Oh my God, he was, he was freed? Yeah. After nine years and then celebrated by his people? Yeah. I don't know what to say about it. Like, uh, I, I went over this and I thought, how are we going to react to this? I knew how you were going to react. I knew you were going to say some of the things you're saying. <laughs> but at the same time, like, I, I just, I was just blown away. I, I, the only real way to, to react to any of this is war is fucking terrible. Yeah. War is terrible. I, the but who were these 15,000 people who went to his funeral? Were they Nazi sympathizers? Oh, I, I, absolutely. Uh, you know. Uh, yeah. Uh, it's just mind blowing. I, I loathe war. I hate war. I, I just, what these poor soldiers on every side have had to see and endure disgusts me. I hate war, but I think every individual who fights 
for our freedom is a hero. Yeah. I have nothing but respect, admiration. They're stronger men than I could ever be, but they shouldn't have to be. Right. They should be able to just live their lives and not go do some politician's fucking bidding. Oh. Well, I mean. There are circumstances where it's just. It made sense for us to go to war against the Nazis. Yes. Yes. I I agree. But, yeah. Oh. But now it's oil. <laughs> Do you think? Mm, yep. I think. <laughs> oh, boy. That's a whole other po- yeah, right? podcast. It's a whole other podcast for sure. So there you go. That's our uh, Remembrance Day episode for this year. Uh, on to our live show, I guess, tomorrow night. Or yeah, uh, Saturday. Saturday. It does feel like Friday. Away. It does feel like Friday yeah. today. But sadly, no, yeah. there's so, work tomorrow. Yeah, by the time you folks hear this, we will have completed our live show, which will be our 100th episode. <laughs> Amazing, right? It's bonkers. So let's get on to our uh, our Patreon shout-outs because I really need to go to bed. Patrone. <laughs> yeah, right? Patrone. Sponsors. Patrone. All right. So let's do this thing. First, I got to bring up the Patreon thing. (sighs) (sighs) Exactly. What'd you think of that guy? I think I'd like to piss on his grave. Right? Do you think I'd get in trouble if I went there and pissed on his grave? You probably would. Which is sad. Yeah. You know, like. Yeah. I try to always, like, some of the worst people. I'm able to find something to pull out of it in in the sense of understanding, Mm -hmm. empathizing. Uh, Individuals like this, though, there's just... Yep. Yeah, what what can I pull out of that? He was dedicated? Like, nothing. Uh, Grave pisserage. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) I just hated him. Like, I just, like, the more I read, I was just like, are you serious? Well, I can only imagine trying to get through this book. Oh, he was just Because like, it's going to be full of his propaganda. Oh, it was. Yeah. And, I mean, you know, he, he thinks Canadians are just garbage. We're the lowest of the low. Um, Which he says from the yeah. comfort of Germany. Yeah. Go, come come to Canada and say Yeah, hey. exactly. Come on over here and have a, let's have a conversation. Yeah, own up to us, you piece of shit. Garbage man. Yeah. Come come to Canada, proclaim... Oh, I know he's dead, but I mean, come to Canada and, and yeah. uh, proclaim your successes. Exactly. And, and then see how garbage we are. So own up to it. Come here. Tell us. Yep. Be a man. Oh, well. And we'll see how that goes for you. All right. Let's do some Patreon shout-outs. Oh, okay. Yeah, let's shake it off. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. No more of that nonsense. Uh, First up, from Aldergrove, British Columbia. Hey, Aldergrove. Natalie Volens. Hey, Natalie. Natalie. Natalie, thank you. Muchos gracias, Natalie. Hopefully we'll see you at the live show when we're, well, maybe we've seen you at the live show by the time you hear this episode. <laughs> it was great to meet you, exactly. Natalie. Fantastic. Yeah. You're Come, so nice. It was nice of you to wait and shake our hand. Exactly, yeah. I, we are going to do that. Oh, yeah, yeah. I think we have to. Yeah. we got to shake the babies and... <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, kiss hands and shake babies. Yeah. 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 Uh, Kathleen Ryan from Queensbury, New York. Is that where the rules of Queensbury come from? The uh, boxing rules? I, what do I know? I don't know. I have no is idea. That a, is that actually a thing? Or I don't I think that's. That a, I think you made that up. I've, n- I've never heard that. Okay. Never heard that. So, but, it, but is Kathleen a boxer? Then she might be. I, she bet she should be. She'd probably take me. If you live in New I'm York, I'm fat and slow. <laughs> if you live in New York, I think at some time you've had to defend yourself. It's New York State. Still. It's a big state. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, still. And, and oh, we'll see you. Hey, thanks for coming to the live show too, Kath. Kathleen. Where's MS? Is it Mississippi? I think it is. Brandy Swilly from Brandon, 
Mississippi. It w- was the place named after you? Or MS is Missouri? I don't know, but I know that a few people who would like to have a Swillia brandy. Ayo. I'm sure she's never heard that. I'm a pioneer of that joke. Yeah. Joke pioneer. Right? A joke yeah. pioneer. Yeah. Yeah. A yeah. Swillia brandy. A swilly of brandy. Yeah. Yeah, she's probably right now canceling her Patreon. <laughs> It was fun while it lasted for that week. <laughs> Madeline Sneed from Monroe, Louisiana. Did we meet you at Crime Con? Because I love Louisiana. Oh, my God, yes. Beignet, amazing. Those oh, yeah. Sugar beignets. Very rarely do those kind of hyped things live up. But that was pretty bomb. Yeah. Well, you know, oh, you've got to try this. you got to try this. And at some point, you start to go like, okay, like now it just it can't live up to this. And you try it. You're like, no, that That, that was, was one exactly of my favorite like, times from that. Just Watching sitting that in that jazz. Play, uh, yeah. play his banjo. I remember saying then, I'm like, we're creating some memories right at this yeah. moment. Me, you, and Jen and sitting We totally there. were. Yeah. Heather Oberhaus from Elgin, Illinois. Hey, Heather. Illinois. I always think about my dad when I think about Illinois. Why because is that? He did his one of his veter, veterinary internships oh. in Illinois. Mm. Yeah, Chicago, Chicago, exactly. Sweet. And that's where he, when he heard about uh, JFK uh, being killed, he like almost drove off the road. Oh, shit. he's driving in the country and he heard JFK is killed yeah. and like almost crashed his car. Oh wow. Yep. Well, I'm glad he didn't. And here's one. This is an interesting one. Okay. Um, I like interesting. The person's name is Whale Biscuit. Okay. Yeah, they're delicious. Well, yeah, but is Whale Biscuit a thing? Yep. So a thing. Yep. She is, she is. Oh, it's a she. Okay. She. Yep. It might be a they. No, 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 no. I know. We've, we've gotten burned by. Uh, I know. No, I know. Assuming genders before. I know, but I know Whale Biscuit. Scott. Uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, and it, I was. It needed to be called though. Whale Biscuit. I know though. You do. I do. Uh-oh. I do. It, it's two names. Uh, it's, you've clearly forgot to put the space in there, but Whale is her first name. Biscuit is her last name. And guess where she lives? In the water. In the Pacific Ocean. I was right. Yep. Wow. Yep, she lives in a whale. So she is a whale biscuit mm-hmm. that lives in a whale. Oh, so the whale ate her. It did? It did, but it's not... How does something that got eaten by a whale... Like, is there a computer in the whale as well for... It is. It's a very. It's this a, is complex. It's a very futuristic whale. Wow! It was. It was. It was sent here from the future. No oh boy! It's kind of cybernetic. Uh, uh, a cyborg. It's a cyborg uh, whale. They really didn't plan it out. Were in the they future. looking for nuclear vessels at the <laughs> same time? <laughs> that was the intent. Uh-huh. You would think in, in the future, they're like, we need to, we've created uh, time machines. Oh, let's send the whale back. Well. It was really poorly planned, but somebody gets to live in the whale and it's a whale biscuit. <laughs> You're insane. Wait, clinically, yeah. Shannon Bachman from Amherst, Ohio. Thank you, Shannon. That sounds like a lovely place. Ohio. Shannon. You know what's round on, the, round on both ends and high in the middle. No. Ohio. I'm not laughing. It, well, it's an old joke. Mm-hmm. It's a dad joke. Clearly. Uh, now, this person has a different username than their actual name. So I'm just going to go with the username. That's usually the, the right thing to do. Tad Savage. Oh, Tad Savage. Tad Savage. My name is Tad Savage. That would be a great... I, okay. That's a great radio name. I like think, I think I might change my name. Like you're a newscaster, Tad Savage here. There's a crash on the uh, 401, but I can't take Tad because it's already. So I'm, I'd be Brad Savage. Brad Savage. This is Brad Savage reporting to you I live think, in I Chopper. Think, you know what I think I'm going to be, Dad Savage. <laughs> I'm Dad Savage. Reporting to you live over Highway 17, where there's been a fatal crash. Tad Savage is from North Saanich, which is close to uh, oh, Victoria. It is, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And it always, always makes me think of a sandwich. Sandwiches. Yeah. yeah, I know. I'd like a North Sandwich. <laughs> Jamie Armstrong from Belleville, Ontario. Oh, hey, Jamie. Wow. Yeah. More Ontario folks. Ontario. Giving, area, giving area, us some love. Ontario. Area, area. Uh, yeah. Bronwyn Geddes. What? That's a 
got some great names. Bronwyn, yeah. That's very uh, Scottish. It, yeah, yes. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, it's very... Bronwyn, what are you doing? It's very Scottish. <laughs> She's a nice wee lass, Bronwyn. I think she must be from Scotland. No, I- India. What? Yeah, New Delhi. I'm not doing that accent. Uh, no. No. It's like Trudeau doing brown face. Yeah, no, it won't go over well. No. No, yeah, no, she's from... I can do Scotland because my grandma was Scottish. Yeah, yeah. The wee little bunny came in my purse. <laughs> oh, Michael, reach in there in my purse and see what the bunny brought you. It brought me a rubber crocodile. <laughs> oh, well, that's what they bring. <laughs> that's what they bring. True. That's what they bring. So Bronwyn yep. is from India, yep. and what does she do? Tech support. At the Scottish consulate. Yes. Yeah. Tech support at the Scottish consulate. Yeah. So, I mean, it comes full circle. Oh, I gotcha. It comes full circle. She's very, very tech savvy. Yep. Yep. Um, she specializes in uh, network cards. Okay. Yep. And uh, is it Does she send network cards for Christmas? Yeah, she does. How do you know? Did oh, you yeah, get well, one? I Did... didn't get one this year. Oh, and maybe next year. Maybe next year you'll get a network card in the mail. Next up is Lamia R... I think we know Lamia, but uh, I'm not entirely sure. What does the R stand for, Scott? Real, real awesome. Real awesome? Yep. So Lamia, real awesome. Yep. One, we, yep. Where's Lamia from? Um, Delta. Delta, yeah. Delta, Delta. Can I help you, help you, help you? Yeah, she's from Delta. Okay, what's yeah. she doing, Delta? She's a meter reader. They don't have meters in Delta, as far as I know. That would, she, what, that's, why, that's why she's unemployed currently, Mike. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah, she decided to go with early retirement. She took the buyout, like you did, and it went with uh, early retirement. And she's just living the good life now. She likes to just drive around. Cool. Yeah, yeah. With her, with her buyout, she bought herself a BMW. And she just likes to, like, she likes to cruise up and down at Robinson, like I used to do when I was a teenager. Wow. Yeah. But now she's not a teenager, but it's like, this is my moment to shine, she said, and she's doing it. Up next, I think we have our first Patreon from the Netherlands. Oh. Wow. And her name is Danielle Van Shake de Jong. That's a great name. Yeah, wow. right? Danielle, Danielle, uh, Danielle Van Shake de Jong. Wow. From Utrecht. Wow, that's a place? Y- yeah, it definitely is. Wow. I know a little bit about the Netherlands because a half of me is from there. Okay. <laughs> but uh, Which half? The, yeah, the, not the right half. Uh, not the tall half, anyway. Because <laughs> the Netherlands, no, nah, Dutch people are the tallest people on the planet. Wow, well, well, you didn't get that. I did not. I no. got the little Jewish man. Yeah, you got that. Yeah, that's... <laughs> yep. <laughs> you nailed that one. Oh, too bad. <laughs> but anyway, Ron Rossman. So thank you, Danielle. By the thank, way, yes, thank you, Daniel. Thank yeah, you, thank from you. From Utrecht, right, so I do want to visit there. Oh, I would love to. Yeah, Holland. My my mother wants to take my brothers and I over to meet our family, and my cousin Rude. Rude. Rude Wolf is his name. What? That, that's a name. That's the best name. That's, it's one of my World of Warcraft characters I've named after him, Rude Wolf. That's a bloody good name, isn't it? Rude. Rude. And then Ross Rossman. Ron Rossman. Ron Rossman. That's like Jimmy James. He's from <laughs> He's from Alexandria, Pennsylvania. Hey, sweet. Right on, Ron. There you go. Ron. Right on, Ron. Oh, I know a guy named Right on, Ron. Do you really? I really do. Wow. Thanks to Laura Teagarden from Riverside, California. Um, hey. You know what? She said she didn't hear a shout out for her, and I am pretty certain that I said her name at some point. Oh. I, I don't know. Okay, I might be well, wrong. Well, Laura, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You're a good egg. Yeah. And here's a shout out. Yeah, there's. it's a big old shout it's out. It's a big old. You. It's not a tiny little shout out. No, it's a big one. You got a big old shout out. So, Laura Tea Garden. I do like, I would like to drink tea in a garden. I'm very, I'm very thirsty. And now you know you're a steep tea guy. So we I can am. Go, Let's go have tea with Laura Tea Garden in a tea garden. Okay, but it's California, so who? Tea gar- uh, California's nice. I'll uh, drive the parts that aren't on fire. <laughs> Not that I'm making fun of this place being on fire because that's horrific. Correct. But uh, but yeah, yeah. We'll go. I'll drive. Got a new car. You know. That sounds like a good idea. Yeah, let's go. Okay, here we come. She's Kelly. probably expecting us now. Yeah. Oh boy. Yeah. Um, Paula Cassidy said, 
Okay, Mike, what have I done to upset you guys? I up my pledge. Everything, everything. But got no mention where well, you can just go shit in your toques. Paula Cassidy Bishop from North Yorkshire, UK. Um, I don't quite understand, though. She says, P.S. I love you guys really XXX, but her pledge is still only a buck. Oh, so, well, she was. Cr- she might have put it up and then put it back down again. <laughs> she was previously at ninety-seven cents, something like that. Yeah. Well, um, we're very sorry, either Cat- way, Paula yeah. Cassidy Bishop. But uh, and, and either way, we didn't mean to upset you. You're the wind beneath my wings. Oh, that's nice, Paula Cassidy that Bishop. That is really you, nice. You inspire me daily just to be a better person, to to live my true life, and, and move forward. So. I thank you incredibly. But hang on, Paul Scott. Cassidy, but yeah? Once we get the donut money, you're going to be amazed. Oh. Remember we just talked about Ron Rossman? I did. Well, he's back again. <laughs> what is happening? With donut money. Duh. Absolutely love the show here in the middle of Pennsylvania State College. I figured I'd burned enough of your bandwidth listening to you, so <laughs> you should get some donuts. Oh. And I don't forget uh, to some Remembrance Day poppies, too. Well, there you go. So he wow. probably knows he's going to be in his Remembrance Day yeah. episode. Sincerely, a diehard Penn State Nittany Lions fan, Pittsburgh Penguins fan, and a total wannabe Canadian. Well, there's nothing wrong with being a wannabe Canadian. We uh, we have just designated you uh, a honorary, honorary Canadian. Honorary Canadian. Consider it done. You can refer you to go. this podcast. We have this authority. You're considered an honorary Canadian, so... Probably so. likes Canada because Sidney Crosby. Yeah, probably. Sidney I Crosby, mean, good Nova Scotian kid. Yeah. yeah. Where do some of the best hockey players on the planet come from? Burnaby. Nova Scotia. Joe Sackett. Burnaby. Nova Scotia. Sure, maybe one or two. <laughs> one or two? <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah. Hermione... Stroud, and it's not Hermione from Harry Potter, which I'm sad about, but I'm happy that Hermione sent us some donut money. So am I. Actually, she says she wants to send a little Nanaimo bar money since I can't make it to the live show. Boo. Oh, that's Aww. okay. So excited for you guys. Wanted to send you a little something. I know it's not much. Love the pocket. Love the podcast and think you're both good eggs. You know what? It doesn't matter what you send. You can just send us... Uh, you know, a, a message saying that you like the show and it means a lot. And it does mean a lot. Yeah. It really does. And here's one from a Canadian immigrant living in the U.S. Oh. And her name is Kate Pearson. She says, Your show gives me much needed peace of home. Hearing the Canadian anthem on your 1st of July episode was especially emotional for me. Thank you all so much for all you do. I hope you get a bathtub full of donuts to luxuriate in. <laughs> Faithfully, a very good egg, Kate Pearson. Thank you Kate. so much, Kate. That, it really means a lot to hear stuff like that. Yeah, that it, stuff actually does move me. Yeah. Uh, to yeah. know that we're, we're having a positive impact in somebody's life. That uh, our, yeah. our ramblings. Especially because I've been a dink most of my life. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, everything balanced is out, Mike. I guess so. i got to make up for it somehow. So I'll just keep at it. Mm-hmm. Yes, please. Here's uh, from Jane Howard. Hi, guys. Some donut money from a fellow veterinarian's kid. Ah. And a big fan of your podcast. Thanks for all your hard work. So she probably likes my vet talk. She, I, clearly. Yeah. Yeah, clearly you and her can, can bond. What we, you know, veterinarian's kids have been through weird things. I, w- I would imagine. Why, helping dad pull out the, uh, porcupine quills. <sighs> Oh God! Yep. I've, like, I've watched enough of the vet shows on TV. Hold the dog. Like, I was terror. The, I was the dog holder while Dad was the uh, plier guy. The poor dog, though, in the yeah. whole, in, in this and, trio, the poor dog. <laughs> yeah, and the dog. I would be petting the dog and comforting it. And I'm stuff. sure. I'm sure, but it's not a pleasant. Th- no. Those those uh, 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 quills aren't made to come no, out because they're barbed. Yes, but uh, <laughs> Dad said one time. This is the fifth time this dog's been here for this. <laughs> dogs don't learn. <laughs> they see the they see the porcupine. It's going. I'm going to get me that. What's this? <laughs> I'm pushing a rock. I'm pushing a rock. Oh, <laughs> uh, well. What can you do? This looks fun. This looks oh, a- amazing. That wasn't fun. <laughs> and Colton Daniel from Whistler, hey. British Columbia, 
Just send us a little donut, donut money. Thank you so oh, much, Colton. Yeah, thank you, Colton, and what a beautiful place you live. Yeah, I love Whistler. Yeah, we still same. need to go up there for the train thing. Oh, yeah, yeah, we didn't go the other yeah, week. No, yeah, yeah, because we, we were just pooped well, hey, and I was sick. Long weekend. Oh, yeah. Maybe we can get her done. Yeah, Monday or something. We'll let's talk about it. That's doable. Yeah. So thanks so much to our patrons, past and present, for your pledges. We really appreciate your support of the show. Hells yeah. If you want to help support the show, you can do so at patreon.com slash darkpoutine, or for one-time support, you can send us donut money via PayPal at our email address, darkpoutinepodcast at gmail.com. Also email us there. If I forget your Patreon shout-out, don't hesitate to call me on it. If you haven't heard it in three weeks after, just call me out. <laughs> Tell me to shit in this house. Yeah, because I'm not good at it sometimes. I make boo-boos. Well, you got a lot going on, Mikey Brown. <laughs> yeah. If you don't already, it would mean a lot to to us. If you subscribe to the show, you can easily find us on iTunes, Podcast, Stitcher, TuneIn, Spotify, or wherever you get your on-demand audio. Check out darkpoutine.com for show notes and other cool stuff. Give us a follow or a like on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Just search for Dark Poutine. Most importantly, tell your friends about us. Word of mouth is a powerful thing, and we'll be back next week with our live 100th episode. Oh, oh. I can't believe it. We actually made it. Yeah, I can't wait for 101 when we get to sit there and talk about how the live show went. Right. Well, because that's probably what we'll do for yeah. a bit. We have to. Yeah. So don't uh. forget, until next week, be a good egg and not a bad apple. Bye-bye, everybody. Chowder, folks. <sighs> <sighs>